How to Achieve Freedom, Episode 5. Hello and welcome. My name is Dan Shielding, and this is the podcast where freedom lovers explore and solve one question. How can we achieve freedom? Here you can learn practical, effective strategies to achieve freedom for yourself, for your loved ones, and to establish a truly free society based on the non-aggression principle. So without further ado, let's get going. This is a very important episode. Today we'll be discussing 12 lessons that I've learned by comparing Ruby Ridge, Waco, and the Bundy Ranch standoff. These lessons are intended to empower you to achieve freedom by collaborating with others and to prevent the loss of human life in that process. A very important topic. It's the part of a series in the uh, in part one, last episode, I, I discussed why I believe the Bundy Ranch standoff is a success for the cause of freedom, why I view it that way. And in the next episode, part three, I'll be diving into one of these one of the most important lessons in greater detail. So tune in for that. But for now, let's get started. 12 lessons that I hope you find helpful. Enjoy. I wanted to understand what happened at Ruby Ridge, and what happened at Waco, and what happened at Bundy Ranch. What were the similarities between those events, and what were the differences? What made the first two tragedies where lives were lost and the Bundy Ranch standoff a success where no lives were lost. How can we achieve more success in the future and avoid tragedy? Let's get into that. All right, so here are the lessons I learned. Number one, you do not want to kill a federal agent. This is incredibly important and presents a dilemma. If a federal agent is trying to kill you or your loved ones. And I will come back to this in more detail, but I just want to make the point that in the first, in the, in the tragedies, Ruby Ridge and Waco, federal agents were killed very early on. And as soon as that happened, the whole priority of the federal agents that were there was no longer what they perceived as justice or whatever. It became vengeance. They were out to murder people in retaliation for the federal agents that were killed. And because they were so bloodthirsty, they really were reckless with other innocent lives. That's how so many innocent lives were lost because they wanted to get their man who they believed killed the federal agents. And in some cases they were dead wrong. They didn't even realize who killed their federal agents. But they wanted to get the guy that they, they wanted to get their suspect and they wanted to murder him. And they didn't care how many innocent casualties were lost in the process. And that was one of those very significant factors that made a difference between the first two tragedies and the Bundy Ranch standoff, where no federal agents were harmed. So that's number one. The next point is video cameras. Okay? Always be recording and be surrounded by others who are recording using a method that cannot be confiscated. That will help you avoid tragedy. In the first two situations, there were no video cameras held by peaceful people. The only video cameras that were used were those operated by the government as surveillance or whatever. And because of this, the federal government felt like, you know, they could basically get away with anything. Nothing was being recorded. So they didn't have that incentive to not commit violence against innocent people. Point the next point I'm going to make is you must maintain access to alternative media. If you don't, you will be vilified and the public will not have access to the truth. Every time anyone stands up to the federal government, they try their best to make those people look like horrible people. At Ruby Ridge, they, want, they wanted everyone to believe that Randy Weaver was a white supremacist, gun-wielding violent person who was plotting against the government. Okay, that's a that's a that's a fairy tale. It's a it's a mythical character that they created. With David Koresh, they wanted everyone to think that he thought he was Jesus Christ. 
They wanted everyone to think that he was a child abuser. Now, I don't know these men personally. I can't vouch for their characters. I don't, you know, I can't read their minds. But I know what the government said about them was largely false in an effort to make them look like monsters that no public would support. And with Clive Bundy, we see the same thing. Only this time, it's racism. They're, they're, you know, just like with Randy Weaver, they're trying to make Clive Bundy look like a horrible racist. So, you need to maintain access with alternative media. Otherwise, your character will be portrayed according to what your enemy, what your opponent wants. The next point I'm going to make is <clears throat> to avoid illegal weapons. Now, this is not foolproof, because the federal government may frame you anyway. But in the first two tragedies, illegal weapons were involved, and that was the justification for raiding their homes. In, at the Bundy Ranch standoff, there was no illegal weapons involved. There was just illegal grazing. <laughs> so it's more difficult to turn public opinion against you if your crime is, you know, producing food for others. So I just avoid illegal weapons. Avoid trading them. Avoid having them. And I, I'm not saying this, this is the way it should be. I'm just saying this is the way it is. And this is a strategic way to increase your chances of avoiding tragedy. Next one. When dealing with government, don't hide in a bunker or isolate yourself far from civilization where nobody can see you die. It's best to be in a populated area with plenty of witnesses where snipers don't have a clear shot. Now, at Ruby Ridge and Waco, let's just discuss each one. Ruby Ridge, the weavers were <clears throat> living off in the forest on a mountaintop. Why? To get away from the government. <laughs> so it didn't really work, did it? And in Waco, everyone was... Uh, especially toward the end, everyone was hiding in a bunker. Well, that's probably throughout most of it, actually. They were hiding inside a building and inside a bunker where nobody could see them. Not even the people who were killing them. You know, the federal agents who killed those people, those federal agents could not even see their victims, which makes it that much easier for them to kill those people. They don't have to see the consequences of their actions. You know, it's like playing a video game. And in all three cases, Ruby Ridge, Waco, and Bundy Ranch standoff, there were snipers. The government set up snipers right away. So you don't want to make it easy for them. You don't want to isolate yourself in the middle of nowhere where they can shoot at you and not worry about hitting anyone else. You don't want to make it easy for them to murder and execute you. That should be common sense. <clears throat> Next point, federal agents will number in the hundreds. You must have more on-site supporters than they do. In all three situations that we're discussing, there were hundreds of federal agents involved. Security in numbers, folks. How do you achieve that? Well, take a lesson from the Bundys. Ray is a large family. Okay, the Bundys have 14 kids, 48 grandkids. That's impressive. <laughs> That's how freedom lovers should live. Imagine if we all had 14 kids and 48 grandkids. How much sooner could we achieve a critical mass and move to a region and convert that culture to a freedom-loving culture? How much easier would it be? Unfortunately, a lot of the freedom lovers I know aren't having any kids. They're too afraid of commitment. <laughs> and that makes me sad. So please, people, we have excellent parenting skills. We're peaceful, after all. So we already have a leg up on a lot of parents out there. Let's raise some kids. Let's raise some happy kids with love and respect. The next thing you can do is connect with as many freedom lovers as, as you can online. So you can find a thousand or more who agree with you on goal, overall strategy, and preferred location. And once you achieve, 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 once you achieve that critical mass, you can converge to a local neighborhood and you can have hundreds of on-site supporters within minutes in a situation like that. So 
That's crucial. And if you find a, an area that is has a very low population, maybe you don't even need a thousand people. But you should try to gain support before you move to a place. And one thing the Bundys had to do, because they didn't have any other choice, is they had to cry out for help. And they had to hope that people were able to come support them. That's the only way they could outnumber the statists, the agents of the government. But it would be much better for us to do that beforehand. So we have that kind of support immediately. And the other thing is, you know who you're, who's going to be joining you. When you make a cry out for help and people come from all over the place, there could be some troublemakers in that group. There could be some bad seeds. There could be some people that crave violence. And you do not want those people in your group. So that's another reason it's important to connect with people online to make sure you share those most important values before you all decide to move somewhere and to implement a strategy. Next point, public relations. On this one, I got to say, the Bundys did an excellent, excellent job, all up until the point where <laughs> they were, Glyde was painted as a racist. Up till then, they were doing incredible. They were, uh, they were giving interviews as much as possible, it seemed, you know, giving public speeches. From my perspective, they seemed to be honest and consistent throughout their messages. They embraced respectful media, and they avoided, for the most part, media that was biased against them. You didn't see too many Bundys in giving interviews on, uh, you know, those those statist mainstream media cable channels. And then let's, let me talk about the uh, <clears throat> the statements that were recorded by Clive Bundy that uh, his critics like to use to paint him as a racist. Now. I'm not going to say whether I agree. With, okay, let me just say, I, I think he underestimates how bad it was during slavery. Can I just <laughs> state the obvious? On the same, at the same time, I got to say, he strikes me as a man who cares about others and he wants everyone's lives to improve. And his main point within those remarks was that government programs make people's lives worse. You know, he could have just said that. And he could have used some much better examples. But... I agree with the point that the government programs make people's lives worse. We have to use our words carefully. And we really should just stop using words that our opponents can take out of context and manipulate and edit to make us sound like horrible people. You know, Morgan Freeman has this great interview where he's, he's basically asked about Black History Month. And... Um, the interviewer asks him, well, well, how do we end racism? And he says, stop talking about it. I'm going to stop talking, calling you a white man, and I'm going to ask you to stop calling me a black man. And I just love that answer because I think it's an excellent strategy if we want to end racism. I mean, imagine if nobody talks about race anymore, how are the next generations going to learn to be racist? They, they can't. You know, all the stereotypes and all the bigotry of the past would just die if we just stopped using words to describe people by race. Instead, I really feel strongly that we need to start describing people on the basis of their actions. And that's it. <laughs> I mean, their actions, their behavior, and their personality, but it all comes down to their actions. Maybe their names too, but that's about it. I don't. I don't use. I try my best not to use words to describe race anymore. The bunnies did an excellent job for the most part during the protest, in terms of making sure the public knew their perspective. Now, the federal agents do not understand your perspective. You must communicate with them as well. So they do. At Ruby Ridge, there were oh, incredibly important facts that the federal agents who were calling the shots were not aware of. Number one, Randy did not saw off those shotguns. Okay, he was basically, the whole thing started because they claimed Randy Weaver sold a, an undercover agent illegal weapons. Those illegal weapons were sawed off shotguns. And according to what Randy told his friend, you know, off camera. He didn't even saw off those shotguns. I, 
so it seems to me it's possible that he just sold those shotguns to the federal agent because the federal agent asked him to sell them to him. And then the federal agent sawed them off to make them illegal weapons. And then he used that to basically threaten Randy Weaver into becoming an informant. Because this federal agent wanted to invest, he was in the process of investigating this white pride racist organization. And Randy Weaver took his kids there because they had these summer camp events. And this federal agent recognized Randy Weaver as someone who was not an extreme racist like the other people there. So he thought he could work with Randy Weaver, but Randy Weaver turned him down. So then the federal agent told him, well, if you don't work for me, don't at work, work as the government informant, we're going to put you in prison for selling illegal weapons. So the federal agents who were in charge of this operation, the siege at Ruby Ridge, they didn't know. I mean, they just assumed Randy Weaver was this illegal weapons dealer. And that, wasn't, that doesn't seem to be true. They also didn't realize, like, the one thing that Randy was convicted of was not showing up to court. And the people in charge of the siege at Ruby Ridge did not even know that Randy Weaver, in the letter he received from his lawyer, it didn't even have the correct court date. So yeah, he didn't show up at court. That makes sense. And the government didn't even wait until the court date that was in that letter to see if he would actually show up to the court date sent to him before they started the siege. Truly amazing. The other thing these federal agents didn't understand is that, I mean, they, they thought the Weavers were in perfect health. They're all just sitting in their cabin, happy-go-lucky, everything's great. Why are they so stubborn? Why won't they come out? They didn't realize that federal agents had murdered Randy's dog, murdered his son, murdered his wife, wounded his friend, and shot Randy Weaver in the back. Okay, this family is, is dead or dying, and the federal government doesn't even realize it. The federal government agents thought the Weavers were plotting against the government, some diabolical plan. Now, the truth is, the Weavers didn't want to have anything to do with the government. That's why they moved off into the forest on top of a mountain to get away from the government. Other thing the federal agents didn't realize is the robot used to deliver the negotiation phone to, the, to Randy Weaver had a shotgun mounted on it. I mean, if you're trying to carry out negotiations, if you're trying to convince someone that you mean them no harm and then you want to you know, arrive at a mutually beneficial conclusion, would you mount a shotgun on the robot <laughs> that you use to deliver a phone to the guy? I mean, unbelievable. The Weavers thought, I mean, they thought with very, with, you know, based on tons of evidence that the government was there to kill them. And if they took one step out of their cabin, they'd be slaughtered. They had every reason to believe that. The federal government agents in charge had no clue of this perspective. They didn't understand it at all. They thought Randy Weaver was a dangerous man killing federal agents. Okay, Randy Weaver never harmed a single person. And that's the truth. So you have to make sure, the fed, not, not just the public understands your perspective, but the federal agents who are involved and those calling the shots understand your perspective because they can make some gross errors and cause a lot of innocent lives to be lost if they don't understand where you're coming from. And you're not just forcing government to see things from your perspective, okay? We obviously know that there's some government agents that don't give a damn. You're trying to identify agents that seem potentially sympathetic or agents that have some smidgen of humanity and you're, you want to share information with them so you can help them prevent tragedy. Give them some information that's useful from their perspective by giving them, you know, sharing some of yours. Next point, redundancy. In all these uh, situations, the government tries to cut off things you rely on. So you have to have backups. You need backup supplies. Food, water, medical supplies, etc. You have to have backup electricity because they're 
bound to cut that. Backup methods of communication in case they deactivate cell phone towers. Redundant surveillance, foot, surveillance footage. You have to make sure you get everything on video. That is so crucial. So you have to have a lot of redundancy there. A lot of people taking video from different angles, different distances, etc. You need alternate escape routes. At Ruby Ridge and Waco, basically the people involved were not allowed to leave. And that's why so many of them died. <clears throat> Next point, if you see tanks or armored personnel carriers that look like tanks, then the government agents are probably not planning on killing your cattle. They're, well, not only your cattle. They're, they're planning on killing human beings. If they have that kind, of, that kind of equipment, they're preparing to kill humans because they're expecting gunfire. If you stay, you may die. If you leave, you may be imprisoned or killed by a sniper. Ideally, you'll want to escape without detection. And I can't tell you exactly how to do that. I mean, things that come to mind are underground escape routes, camouflage. <sighs> what else is there? <laughs> Optical illusions? I don't know. You got to come up with ways to escape that allow you to remain unseen to snipers. Because in all three of these events, there were snipers. And especially if the government comes and invades you when you're at home or in a building somewhere, and you're not in the public view, then you really got to watch your back. You, uh, you got to be careful. You got to leave, but you, you can't be uh, leaving in the sights of a sniper rifle. Another point, and this seems you know maybe a little silly, but it's just something I noticed, and I, I want to learn as much as I can from these situations. So don't let your dogs run loose. At Ruby Ridge, violence began when the Weaver's dog playfully ran up to a federal agent, and the agent murdered the dog. That's what started gunfire. And when you have people who are in fear of their life and you have unidentified men in the woods or wherever shooting their guns, okay, it's incredibly frightening and there are likely to be people who shoot back in defense and that's how people get killed. And if any federal agent gets killed, we've been over that. Okay, that can result in tragedy. So, yeah, at Waco... They had a lot, a lot of dogs there too. And the plans of the people who were committing the initial raid was to shoot and kill those dogs if they approached the front entrance. And you see a photograph, all those dogs are dead. So here you have a siege, you know. You have a SWAT team in raiding a home. And they start shooting their weapons because there's dogs running around. What are the people inside going to do? They're going to freak out and they're going to try to defend themselves. I mean, that's a natural reaction. So when you have dogs running loose, this is what's bound to happen. One more point, critical thinking. A common thread between Waco and other horrible tragedies like Jonestown, the Holocaust, any war waged by government, the common thread is a large group of people following the orders of a few without much critical thought. And that is a recipe for disaster. So, I strongly encourage you to question everything other people tell you. Don't fall for appeals to authority or any other logical fallacy. Become familiar with all the logical fallacies so you can smell baloney. Be suspicious of anyone who excludes himself from the rules he imposes on you. That's one of the main reasons we cannot trust government aggressors, because that's what they do. There's one set of rules for us and a different set of rules for them so that they can commit crimes that we obviously can and should not commit. 
It's very difficult to know exactly what the Branch Davidians believed and what David Koresh told them. But there's a lot of evidence that does support the idea that David Koresh imposed rules on his followers that he did not practice himself. And if that was the case, which I'm not saying it is, but if it was, and the Branch Davidians had used critical thought to recognize that as red flag and leave the compound, then they would not have died at Waco. So, in that case, critical thinking could have prevented the loss of 84 lives. So I had to mention that. Here's the message of the day. The Bundys and their supporters did such an outstanding job. They made so many good decisions, as you can tell by all the lessons I learned from their example. I commend them. That said, we can do better next time, folks. We can keep learning from these experiences and do better next time and the next time. Until one day, we have so much wisdom and experience establishing and maintaining freedom that the government aggressors will avoid you committing aggression against us like they avoid poking a skunk with its tail up. It just won't be worth it to them. It'll be a no-brainer. So let's look forward to that day. All right, that concludes this episode. In the next episode and the final part of this series, I dive into the dilemma. If harming government agents leads to tragedy, which I believe it does, what if government agents threaten our lives? How do we handle that? This is something it's that we really need to talk about if we're serious about avoiding tragedy. So I hope you'll join me. Thank you so much for listening. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to rate and review it at iTunes App Store. That can help out a lot. And you can share it with a friend that finds it helpful as well. Strongly encourage that. If you want to leave a comment on this particular episode, you can go to howtoachievefreedom.com slash episode five. All constructive feedback is welcome as well as harsh criticism. I, I can take it. Don't worry. Every day we can learn something and do something to achieve freedom in our lives. Start by connecting with other freedom lovers online. That's your action step. Wishing you love, peace, freedom, and happiness. Take care.